last season, uh, another self-promotion coming, um, on the Century Lives podcast, we did a season on called Place Matters. Uh, and it was, it was uh, actually working off some of the data that Roz Chetty had done, mentioned earlier, about um, that shows such almost a 100% uh, um, uh, relationship between income and uh, communities that live longer. Um, but we wanted to look at a handful of places that sort of broke that rule and try to understand why. And we didn't have a lot of um, um, understanding exactly. We found six places that perform much better than they should, mostly low-income communities. Um, and um, we didn't really know why when we went there. Uh, so we went to some really interesting places, Presidio, Texas, which is uh, um, the, one of the poorest counties in Texas and one of the 10 longest lived counties in the country. Um, we went to uh, Woodlawn, uh, a uh, purpose-built community in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, very interesting place. Um, and then we also, one of the other episodes was on a place called Co-op City. So Co-op City, if you've ever driven north on 95 through the Bronx, uh, on the Cross Bronx Expressway um, is about 25 enormous buildings on uh, the east side of the highway, um, identical. And I'd driven past them probably 150 times in my life without ever knowing what they were. Uh, it turns out that Co-op City is the uh, largest naturally occurring retirement community in the world, um, 20,000 people there. Um, and it uh, was built in the late 60s as workforce housing, um, affordable housing for middle and lower income people. And people live there live forever. We wanted to find out why. Um, and the answer turns out to be, perhaps seems sort of obvious to say it after the fact, but um, turns out when you give people affordable housing, which they can stay and they, everyone stays there until they die, um, they build community, they can put more money into healthcare and other things and education and other things they couldn't if they didn't have affordable and stable housing. Uh, and housing was the key to longevity in that community which is why it's the largest in the world. Um, and uh, it was a real lesson, I think an important lesson, and makes me really interested to hear the conversation between Paul and Julia on housing and its importance to um, uh, um, longevity and, and equity. Um, uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, introduce Paul Irving. Uh, I think most of you know him. Uh, he's uh, now a senior advisor to the Milken Center for the Future of Aging. Before that, he was the founding chairman of it. Um, before that, he was the CEO of the Milken Foundation. Um, but most importantly, he's a friend and advisor to you know, everyone in the community. And uh, really great to have you here, Paul, and uh, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, welcome. How are all of you doing? Everybody, everybody okay? Good. Um, so, so um, housing, I, I, I want to harken back to Ken Dykewald's comments er earlier today. This is one of those things that when we think about the big ask, when we think about the, about the big picture, the big thing that needs, needs to be done, housing has to be part of it. You know, housing is a, <clears throat> it's a, a basic human need and, and in many, many ways, a basic right. It's really one of, if you think about it, maybe one of the first couple things that human beings identified as a need, really, really food and shelter, right? Kind of the first, the first thing from the caves. And yet here we, here we are and, uh, and we have a problem that we're gonna talk about today. So we're joined by, we're very lucky to be joined by Julia Gordon. Julia is uh, not only the assistant uh, Secretary of, of HUD, who's responsible for housing, or the czar, as, as many of us know her. But she's also uh, the commissioner of the, of the FHA, uh, better known as Commissioner Gordon for you Batman fans. Um, <clears throat> and, and we hope where we're headed is not Gotham City in the United States. So Julia, well, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, so we, what we know is housing is important and we know that we have inadequate supply, uh, uh, unaffordable expense, uh, a record level of, of uh, people experiencing homelessness and a frightening trend of older and older people who are really now not only housing insecure, but also face the, the potential prospect of either loss of their homes or having no place that they need to live. So. Uh, so how do you sleep at night? <laughs> uh, I have a tough job. Um, 
Can you hear me? I can't yes. tell. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I don't know most of you, unlike everybody knows Paul, apparently. Um, <laughs> and I am delighted that it was Ken Stern's idea to have me here because I don't get to hang out in rooms where I don't know anybody. Um, and that's so important that we all be talking to each other and understanding how everything we work on intersects with everything else. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. And I'm here to tell you to be afraid to be very afraid. Um, we, ha we have an affordable housing crisis in this country. Um, you all already know that, you've read about it. But interestingly, when we, when we look at how uh, different policies uh, get political juice at any point, housing seems to be, it's sort of like the air. Everybody knows that they need housing, but they don't think about it a whole lot or get very intentional about it. And when I go to audiences and they you know, want to know why they you know, should care what I do, I say, well, do you live somewhere? So do you live somewhere? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually here. How many, how many people in the room own a home? Uh, show, wow, show of hands. Luck, a lucky group. So, um, when you overlay the question of longevity and seniors with housing, we see a very disturbing picture that has changed a lot over the years. Um, a few things have changed both on the home ownership and on the rental side. On the home ownership side, more and more people are going into their retirement years still carrying a mortgage. That was not the case some decades ago. Um, you know, if, if you, Many of you in this room do remember the idea that someday you would have that mortgage burning party. Um, but as things in the housing finance system changed in the 90s and uh, refinancing mortgages became big business, um, you saw more and more people uh, using financial tools that they didn't fully understand and that would result in them still having a mortgage payment when they retire. However, even if you have fully paid off your home by the time you retire, um, there are two things that you still have to do until you die, which is pay your taxes and pay your property insurance. Um, property taxes have become the go-to for municipalities to fill budget holes. And right now, the biggest crisis within housing that very few people are talking about, and some of you in this room may not have even been in this conversation yet, is the cost of property insurance, of hazard insurance. Um, but I bet a lot of you, all those people just raise your hand that you own a home, you probably got an insurance bill recently where you were like, huh, this looks bigger. Or you got a note from your mortgage company saying, we need a little bit more in your escrow. Or if, you, or if you live in California, you got a letter saying, we no longer write in right. California. Which California, is, which is more Florida, likely. and yeah. an increasing number <clears throat> of places, which is, yeah, you're, you're on your own. Yeah. Um, and so even for people who have done exactly what they need to do for housing security, which is buy a home with a fixed rate mortgage early and pay it off, they are still facing pressures during those longer years that they have to live there. But we are seeing a decline in the number of people who are able to buy homes, and that is changing as demographics change. Um, buying a home is the vast majority of white households in America buy a home. That is not true for any other demographic group. Um, and it is not likely to be anytime in the near future, given uh, what homes cost right now and, and what mortgages cost. So a lot of people are in the rental market where they are um, at the mercy of rent increases, um, sometimes being told they have to move because maybe they're in an affordable building and the landlord wants to take it to be a market rate building, you know, then they have to move. Um, and we now have more than 10 million senior headed households who pay more than 30% of their income for their housing, and half of those pay more than 50% of their income for their housing. So all of the things we're talking about here, 
Um, we're, we've been talking a lot about the sort of revenue side of retirement. This is the expense side, and this is not sustainable with any of those revenues. Especially on the rental side, this used to be a coastal problem, a California problem, a New York problem, a DC problem. Now this is an everywhere problem. And talk to anybody. I, I just uh, I just left Columbus, Ohio, where I did help um, cut the ribbon on some new senior housing, which was really fun, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but they're they're getting a new chip factory, and nobody can find housing uh, who they're trying to get in there to work in this factory. Um, we hear this all over the country with you know, the infrastructure bill and some of the other investments we've made through the, the various big bills during COVID, which is where, do, where, do, where are our employees going to live and where can they afford to live? Wages have not remotely kept up with either rental or homeownership costs. Um, but I'm going to add, I'm going to add yeah, a couple of sure. more parade okay. of horribles because yeah. I have one shot at you and I only have like 26 more minutes. Um, <laughs> So I also want to talk about accessibility. Yep. Um, as we grow older, uh, there are, there's a higher chance that we experience some kind of physical disability. Um, I, 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 and you don't notice it till it happens. I had my knee replaced a few months ago and I was walking around for a while uh, using crutches. And I discovered that at my office, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, I couldn't open any of the doors. It was crazy. Um, the estimates are that fewer than 4% of all homes um, are fully accessible, adhere to the principles of universal design. Um, and we are, not, we are not really forcing the issue anywhere by, by public policy. Um, just to zoom out a little from the, the buildings themselves and the financing of them, um, we have a desperate need for supportive services, um, for healthcare staffing. 98% of households say they want to age in place, but they cannot find the support to do that. Even if they can you know, somehow retool their home so they can stay there physically, um, get finding that aid, even if you can afford it, which most people can, finding that person is becoming more important. A foot, by the way, footnote for those of you interested in U.S. immigration policy, I'll just I'll just leave, leave it at that. <clears throat> that too. Yeah. Um, and that's an issue throughout all of housing, actually, because sure one of the reasons it's so expensive right now to buy a house is because we have probably the lowest supply ever of houses to buy. Um, and on both the home ownership side and rental side, labor costs have gone up considerably and you can't even find enough people to build the houses. Um, so, you know, and then there's all the neighborhood stuff. We've talked a little bit about it already, whether it's access to transportation or other amenities or other kinds of supports. Uh, in many places, you're kind of on your own too. The um, effect of zoning and land use policies is really, really important. True. Um, you, the, you know, it's funny, I, I was looking at this um, poster while I was <laughs> sitting over there. And I was like, well, that's interesting. We're having a conversation about longevity and aging, but you've actually, we have, we have, um, two places represented up here. It's not like we didn't have, I don't know, nobody put like walkers up there or something. What you put up there was buildings and a rural area. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the, if you do not have a place to afford to live, um, and that place might be your own home, it might be an, an independent living in a rental, or it might be assisted living or a nursing home. These are places to live too. Um, you will end up unhoused. And the fastest growing percentage of the, what we see of the growing unhoused population is made up of seniors. 
And the, <clears throat> I was when I was interrupting before, I was just going to overlay uh, Ken Dykwold's uh, number on health cost. So, so uh, Joe, yeah, out of out of pocket cost for the sixty five and at over cohort, which was five 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 hundred and fifty thousand five hundred fifty thousand bucks. So, if you overlay Julia, Julia's number on on housing cost and that cost, and of course the the level of wealth of the of the aging population, we know we're heading toward a wall. So, <clears throat> I could simply offer to buy everybody in the room a drink. <laughs> And we could all go for a long walk and 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 hold our head in our hands. So what's the what's the answer to this? And I, by the way, I have to say I'm asking somebody who's also doing this in the context of a broken, confused, angry, distracted Washington D.C. So so how are you going to solve this problem for us? Well, you know, it, it is funny you say that because as I sit here, we are potentially 11 days out from a lapse in government appropriations. Yeah. Um, do you know what that does to my ability to get any of these things done? It stops it in its tracks. Um, now, you know, in m many things do continue to get done. We, we do continue to, the vouchers are funded, et cetera. But a lot of our important work cannot happen when the government runs out of funding. And just in case anybody thinks it is normal. It is not normal for governments to operate that way, and we have to stop normalizing it. Um, this is just. It is crazy how much time I spend managing to the imperatives of whether my money is about to run out or I can't execute this contract because there's not enough money to do it, et cetera. But I will say at HUD, um, don't laugh. We're from the government and we're here to help. <laughs> and you know, I, I was saying at lunch to some people, I wish that had not become a, a, a punchline, which you know, I attribute to Ronald Reagan and um, you know, however, however good that may look in retrospect compared to some things we've had. Um, the, there are so many important, <clears throat> critical programs for seniors and for everybody else that are run through federal government agencies like my own. Um, and in this area, we are we are try, we are throwing everything up at the wall to increase housing supply, to increase affordability. And to get creative about things like intergenerational living or how you retrofit homes to make them more accessible, to make them more energy efficient, to make them more climate resilient. And we have a whole range of things that we have been able to do. Um, one thing I'm really excited about seems like a really small thing, but it checks a bunch of those boxes. We've spent a lot of time trying to modernize the financing system for manufactured homes. Um, if, if you don't work in this area, you might think trailer park and you might have a certain image in your mind. And that image is very, very outdated. What we are able to do in factories now is incredible. Um, we can produce homes that I would dare anyone, and I know this because I have, I have failed the quiz a number of times um, that I've been given by some of our partners to tell the difference between a home built in a factory and a home built on site. Um, but our whole financing system for that is, is light years behind. And so something we're trying to do at HUD is twofold. Um, in the Office of Housing, we both have the Office of Manufactured Housing, which develops the only existing federal building and construction code um, that governs manufactured housing, which will allow these, these modern, home, modern looking homes that have the features that consumers want uh, to be produced. But we also have the Federal Housing Administration and its single family uh, mortgage loan products and we have a product, uh, we have two products, in fact, one that lets people buy manufactured homes 
um, that as real estate where they own the home and they own the land under it. And one that allows people who might live in a manufactured home community where they don't own the land under their unit to buy their unit. That's called a personal property loan. Um, and these are things we are modernizing for the first time in decades. Many, many seniors take advantage of this housing type. Um, and so I spend a lot of time trying to break down the stigma because all that you've heard about, you know, the zoning and land use fights that you're probably having in your neighborhoods, the NIMBY fights, um, try changing the code to accommodate manufactured <laughs> housing. Everybody looks at you like you've grown a second head, but I've done a lot of work in um, neighborhoods where there's a lot of vacancy and blight. And I will tell you, if you already have properties that already have utilities, they already have electricity and water and sewer and everything, it is so inexpensive to take one of these homes and pop it on there as opposed to building something from scratch. But the zoning codes often do not permit it. And that's kind of nutty. So, so what can the federal government do since a lot of this is local? Um, the federal government goes to things like this and yells about it. So you'll all go out yeah. there and do something and in your localities. Um, we can also, and we often do, condition certain types of funding on doing certain things. And we are putting zoning and land use into every single um, notice of funding opportunity that you'll see out there because this is absolutely critical right Although, now. So, did you, but Julie, let me just put, push back for a second. So, you and I talked about this this earlier. Um, we well, we talked about social determinants, and <clears throat> we were talking about not only the elements, the elements, but also communication about it. So, we have a lot of conversation, not surprisingly, about health. Uh, and about a number of other things, obviously income inequality and, and, and the like that kind of go into the go into this into the soup. But we don't hear a lot about housing. I'm trying to remember when I the last time I heard Joe Biden in, in one of his speeches, and I'm sure you're trying to slip lines in on a regular basis with his speech writers. But but why I talked about the fact that you know kind of housing and food may be the first the first two inclinations of, of any and any member of our of our species. Why is it that housing doesn't rise to the to the level of some of these other things that we talk about all the time? Well, I have no answer for that. Um, I don't. So what's, you know, what's if you look it? at across some of the big <clears throat> bills, in particular, Build Back Better, there was a very significant housing investment that was initially in that bill and that ended up on the cutting room floor. And I can't really explain that. Um, other than, I, I mean, the housing industry does have lobbyists, just like every other industry, but there is something about this issue, and I'm I, this, this sounds weird, but I feel like people have given up. I feel like people think it's too big and too hard, and there's nothing they can do, and so they kind of throw up their hands. There is also another more technical reason that sometimes this happens, which is a lot of the affordable housing we do build is supported by tax credit programs. Tax credit programs go through a committee in Congress that doesn't know anything about housing. Um, and so it can sometimes, you know, fall down in, in the um, priorities. We have, you know, many priorities. But, you know, when I think about Ken's speech earlier, why, what is the, why are we not looking at this like the big, incredible, looming, hairy audacious one big, goals. very yeah. hairy, yeah. Audacious, big, hairy, audacious <clears throat> goal? Um, is they they cost money. Um, building housing costs money. It it, it isn't a question of um, changing a definition or uh, you know let's um, let, let let let's invent some new thing that allows us to do more with less. Um, building housing takes materials and labor and, you know, land, which is right. in some places scarce. It just costs money. We know how to do this. We know how to make sure that people aren't unhoused. Um, we saw even during, during, during the Obama administration, 
we took uh, veterans homelessness down by over half and in some places got it to zero. We know exactly how to do this. It just, it takes money. And all I can say is, I hope everybody joins in the advocacy for it. Well, so well, I'm gonna, before we're done, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna ask, uh, ask what people in the audience should, should do. But um, so, so since we know there are limits on, on public finance, what are, the, what are the levers that could drive more private capital to this challenge? So in the Office of Housing at FHA, here's what I do at the Office of Housing, um, because you may, you may not, a lot of you know or have connections with the, the Community Planning and Development um, Office at HUD that gives out the grants, the CDBG grants and the home grants and um, you know that kind of thing. But in the Office of Housing, we have FHA. FHA is one of the original public-private partnerships. We don't actually make mortgages at FHA, we insure mortgages. And by having the government and its full faith and credit stand behind those mortgages, our private partners, our private lending partners are able to push further than they would otherwise. We have a single family portfolio. I mean, by, have, by, by the way, yeah. me, does anybody know what FHA, Federal Housing Administration, this is, this enab enables her to, to, in, to, provide, even though you're not the provider, you're the guarantor, to provide loans with higher loan to value ratios than, than would be the case in the- Yeah, in, in single in, family, you can get a low right. down payment loan. <clears throat> low down payment loan. Um, and you can get it with much lower credit scores than right. you would be able to get a conventional market loan. And you know, similarly in multifamily rental housing, um, you are able to come and do deals that you might not be able to do in the purely private market, something very few people know about, but I think is important for this audience. We also have a healthcare portfolio, and the majority of that portfolio is nursing homes and assisted living, um, which we all know we have a terrible shortage of. Terrible. We especially find ourselves working in rural areas and other places where financing just doesn't go by itself. Um, and so these are all ways that we work together with the private sector. Also on the rental side, my office oversees um, what's called project-based rental assistance. Now that is different from what you think of as individual housing choice vouchers that a family gets and it's portable and they could go take it to where they wanna live. This is basically subsidies for rental buildings. And one of those programs is our section 202 program, which is a senior housing program that among other things can provide interest-free capital advances for people creating um, these, these uh, uh, units. And it's been extraordinarily successful, um, again, partnering with nonprofits, with for-profits, working with lenders, working with uh, housing finance agencies in the States, but again, we are limited only by the amount we have. The more, every dollar that the Office of Housing gets from Congress gets leveraged many, many times out there with all these other partners and all these other sources um, and works frequently with the low-income housing tax credits. Um, but again, I don't, the, I, we need to find the will to fund this to the point where we can address the needs of what we see of this huge bulge of people about to come into the system yeah. and need some kind of help with their housing. Yeah, how many people want to see Nana on the street on the streets in, in, in about a, in about a decade? Where's by the way the woman who the young woman from the Young Invincibles from this morning? Because I swear I think I think her what did she leave? I think her one liner was the one liner that should be the should be the theme of this this entire summit and that was can she she said uh, do we basically believe and I'm going to paraphrase I'm going to get her words wrong but do we basically believe in brave individualism and this notion of self-sufficiency or do we have some sense of responsibility to the collective to the to the greater greater good I think it's the question that we don't fundamentally ask ourselves in America and it's time we do we, or time if we you're have just that, being selfish like 
<laughs> yeah, I know that there are those. I'm going to raise my hand because this is my mom lived in a section 202 building um, because my mom's social security check, which was her entire retirement plan, was $950 a month, um, which doesn't go very far. And if she hadn't had subsidized rental available to her either, well, she, of course, would have lived with me and then my husband would have left me. Um, <laughs> But that's not, you know, that's also not what she wanted. She wanted to be independent. And what she found in a Section 202 building was not only did she find that affordable housing, but she found that community. Um, and there, there was a big sense of, there was actually more community in that building than I've seen True. almost and anywhere. The, and this by, this, by the way, of course, is not just a challenge for older adults. It's a challenge for young people. I think I see, did I see Trent Stan sitting over there? I think I do. Um, so, so what we know is that there are a number of really in, innovative housing solutions involving intergenerational. Don't, don't laugh, Trent, or I'll make you come up. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, inter intergenerational solutions that really address the, the both yeah. the housing needs of younger and older adults and that benefit from the interaction between the, the two. So there's two a, things a we're working we on do. a lot. Yeah. One is accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Yeah. And another is we have a renovation loan product where you can borrow um, you know, more than the mortgage so that you can fix up the house and the, what most, what the plurality of people are doing is fixing up houses so that another generation can, can live there. They can do, they can do co-housing co arrangements. Yeah. So um, I'd like to make sure if there are any questions or comments or reactions and I, uh, so, yeah, yeah. So the, you know, this is, this is a zoning decision that gets made at the, state or local level but what what we are seeing is that it does seem to be slightly lower hanging fruit than other kinds of density you know than than small apartment buildings or even two to four unit buildings somehow the accessory dwelling unit has broken through some of the political noise and so at least at fha we're trying to lean into that a little bit and we just rolled out a change to our policies, which say that if you are buying a home that has an ADU, you can count the rental income from it to underwrite your loan. And that does two things at one time. It makes it easier for people to afford a house and it creates more affordable housing, often in neighborhoods where it's really, really lacking, often places where you don't see <coughs> teachers or first responders able to afford. Um, and so it, it is sometimes rented by a third party or it's really you know, used for, for parents or for children. Um, and something we did that nobody's done before, which is we went a little further because I, don't know, I only get to be in this job for a few years. And so I have to do all the things that I can. Um, we actually said you can count prospective income if you haven't built that ADU yet. So if you want to get that renovation loan and use it to build an ADU that will give you that stream of income, we will count that income toward it. Um, and we know that many homeowners who also have rental units often um, do a great job of building their own wealth. And in fact, it's one of the ways that especially immigrant families have taken a lot of advantage of that kind of wealth building. Um, but it's a way that many low income borrowers, borrowers of color um, are able to afford a home and then build wealth through it. And by, and by the way, since uh, Alan Patrickoff, I think said earlier, you're the, you're the oldest person in, in the room. If you don't know Alan, uh, he's an iconic investor and venture capitalist and creator of a, of a really interesting venture capital fund focused on the longevity economy. So before you leave today, you should explain to Alan what his investment opportunities are in this space. So, so, many so we, have some, we have some capital applied before, before we leave. I'm coming to you, Ken. We have that uh, 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 there's a there's a question right here, she and she's looking a for a microphone. mic. Okay, oh you you had a mic. I'm sorry, you have a question. 
Uh, yeah, I have a question from the online sure. audience. Shoot. Um, this audience member asks, uh, we've always been told that our homes are the safest investment for a retirement because demand will always be high. However, looking at Europe as a example of a precursor of what might happen to an aging society, um, do or should we have any concerns that housing will no longer be the safe guarantee that it used to be, particularly in areas of the country considered less desirable. And with following, following fertility rates, is there a risk that homes would be worth less in the future than they are today due to shifts in supply and demand? So I'm gonna answer that question by talking about the difference between a home as an investment and a home as a place to live. Um, I, I am a strong home ownership advocate. It's what I've, it, it, the, the part of my job where I do all this rental work is newer to me because I come from a background of working on mortgage and home ownership. And for the vast majority of people, home ownership is a way to have a stable place to live where, I mean, not only can you, you know, paint the bedroom whatever color you want and have the door jam where you measure your how big your kids have gotten, but it is also a place that some landlord isn't going to just kick you out of. I grew up in single family rental. And let me tell you how good I am about getting the U-Haul and putting everything into it. Um, and that's, I've owned a house now for 23 years and I haven't had to rent a U-Haul a single time. Um, so, 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 so while investment, you, while investment you, is, while is you are, when you buy that home, you are essential. I mean, for what you're, yes, you're paying the bank, there is interest on it, but you are essentially paying yourself. And when you leave, even if the value of the home declines, which could happen in some areas, generally speaking, home price appreciation has roughly kept, place, kept pace with inflation in most places. Certainly there's probably some rural places where that isn't true. Um, but the, at the end of the day, you have, you built equity and you have that equity, um, even if you, if, if somehow the price goes down, what I do not recommend is using home ownership as an investment opportunity. Um, the past number of years, the past, well, up until the financial crisis, and then with a whole new group of people after the financial crisis, with some of the crazy home price appreciation we've seen in a couple of years, a lot of people, especially younger people, um, really think, oh, it's just, I'll buy this house and in five years, I'm gonna sell it for twice as much. That's not gonna, that's not gonna keep up now that we're back in a more normalized rate environment. And it's just not a good idea to think of it that way. But when a lot of economists like to hang out with the housing people and tell us what a bad idea home ownership is. Um, and then, well, for a while I used to do this secretly. Now I do it openly, which is I would go check to see how many houses they owned. Um, <laughs> because you can't live in your 401k. You can't live in your investment fund. This is giving you a stable place to live. And generally we know that home ownership rates are correlated with the other social determinants. They are directly related to education quality and to health and to public safety and to transportation and to every other amenity that you can think of. And so I am still an advocate. Okay, so Julie, I'm gonna stop. we're out of time, I'm gonna stop you, but. <clears throat> just, that just, one more person just, just for people to, to think about, lightning round, one sentence, that's it. I'm holding you to it. What's the what's the ask to, to, to the crowd? What's the ask? You got an opportunity here on stage. Here you are. What do please, you want? What do you want to do, to do? Please figure housing into the way you're thinking about longevity and help us advocate for more investment in it. Thank you, Julie Gordon. <laughs>